I'm Joe Normal, and you're watching Guitar Tales with Dave Cohen and Scott Guitarmasis Engel. Have a rockin' day. And I will listen up. Here we are in Noise Network Studios. This is Dave Cohen, and this is one of my favorite things that we've started doing on Guitar Tales. Uh, we call it the Intermezzo Show. Um, still supported by our friend Charles Larita over at uh, Mischief Studios in Pennington, New Jersey. Scott and I still have to do a ride down there because I have some guitars that need his help. Uh, but thank you so much, Charles. Uh, this show is what Scott and I talked about that we do in between our regular shows because every time Scott and I get together, including what will happen tomorrow night when we're having dinner in Asbury Park, we start talking and we've been saying, that's a show. And it really is. It's, it's a couple of guys who really enjoy guitar, music, Scott gigs regularly. I do not, but I love guitar. And we chat and we talk about things that might be of interest to you. So tonight, one of the things that we've touched upon in some shows that we really give a shit about is the impact of social media, but more specifically YouTube, and the ability to grab one of these guys and watch a video and learn how to play a song, and how that's impacted upon the young, the new, the older, and the established guitar players. How does it affect our growth? How does it affect our appreciation and enjoyment of the instrument? So, uh, Scott, why don't you come in here, and let's start talking about welcome good evening oh your voice sounds really good tonight <laughs> we got our, our mic going and i'm such a knucklehead scott was yelling at me he kept saying you're on mute because i did this let me see if i could do it on camera and you can't hear me and then yeah, make, I, sure, make sure it's off okay no. talk make sure okay yeah right so you know when scott and i were in crappy bands together back in the day like middle schoolish kind of stuff and you know, when we had to learn songs, it was usually Scott teaching me or putting on a cassette tape and playing it over and over and over again and trying to divine what was there. So my question for you, Scott, I, I am not an accomplished guitar player. You are. In the, you are, whether you're <laughs> played or not. In, in the arc of your development as a guitar player, do you think those years when you didn't have what one might call a crutch, uh, to help you learn the song do you think that extra hard level of learning helped you grow well i have to <clears throat> throw in here in the early days i was not a guitar player i didn't start playing guitar until i was in college right right so when i was with you i was playing drums and piano now right. drums to learn off a record no offense drummers because i'm one of them one of you guys uh you can hear the drum beat right if you can yeah. copy that drum beat and you're you're kind of good to go and that's why everybody knows how to play uh yyz on the dashboard of their car we do but once you try to get into chord structure uh in trying to figure out what notes are what and you got weird different tunings and you're trying to figure out a hendrix song and it's an e flat and you got a guitar that's tuned up to e because you don't know any better and you're like i can't figure out why this is so hard to play you know uh the youtube revolution it was huge for me that even now to learn cover songs and stuff for the smoke jackets Without that, it was very difficult. You, Like you said, you would learn a song from your friend. Yeah. Uh, but you, you, you always had that one friend that was good at guitar, right, in the neighborhood? Every band I was in, in high school, college, and even law school, um, I, I would have I, I had to have the better musicians teach me. There were, mm -hmm. I think for me, there were, there were very, very few songs. And, and the hardest song we did was Spirit of the Radio. We got to that, and we did a moderately okay job with it, I guess. So how do you and, learn that Spirit of the Radio riff right there? How do you, how did that guy figure that out? I don't know. He just taught me. That's all I know. Did he get oh, out? Of, we, had, we had musician, uh, we had the guitar for the Practicing Musician magazine in those days, right? right? We can use yeah. the tabs. Once yep. you figured out how to use tabs, it was like learning bar chords for the first time. It was like, oh, is that oh, how yeah. you it? Bar chords was revelatory for me. Yeah, same here. Yeah, I, I took in my uh, life maybe three guitar lessons. One was from a girl, not even a woman yet. I was probably 14, and she was 16 in Hazlitt, New Jersey. Really? 
Yeah, I just she was taught out of her house and she you told took me bar course. Lessons for my ex-wife. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> but I, it was one lesson and she taught me bar chords and it was revelatory. But then again, one I lesson. one lesson and I, I didn't master it then, but I, I had it understood what you could do and how you can right. move your hand around on the neck. But I'm, my question for you is a little more specific. So we know it's harder or it was harder, right? Right. Did you benefit as a musician? Yeah, this is from, going back to your original question. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. I had a little ADD here. But get, <laughs> to That's because my question was wrong. We weren't playing together when you were first learning guitar. Oh. But, when, but when you did, we still didn't have YouTube for a couple of decades. So you said, <sighs> give me, uh, the, the question yeah. is. So like, so right now, let, let's compare, you know, a 15-year-old uh, young woman wants to learn how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And she might take lessons, she might not, but she can hop on YouTube and there's a thousand tutorials to learn any song she wants to learn. There's a thousand tutorials, how to play any chord she wants to play. Right. Take the same young woman back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or even early 2000s. Those resources aren't available. So if, if she's taking lessons, once she is not in the lesson, so if it's a once a week lesson for an hour, well, that leaves the rest of the week, the rest of the hours of the day. And when she is struggling to learn this or that, is the struggle itself something that makes her a better uh, musician because she doesn't have that shortcut? Sort of like paying your dues kind of a thing. Yeah. And, and just the process of having to really carefully listen Mm -hmm. to what's going on, then try to translate what you're listening to into your finger positions, into how you strum and right. pick, as opposed to someone on a video telling you, you don't, when you don't have to go through that and it becomes, it's still hard, but that much easier. I wonder if those shortcuts interfere with people's growth. Well, that, isn't that, you know, it's not necessarily a shortcut, but that's a very specific uh, talent to listen to a song and be able to know Oh, that's a D. That's an A. That's a this or yeah. that or whatever. Or even pick up on what the tuning is. Right. You know, one, one thing that really threw me off in the early days was cashmere, which okay. is a dad dad tuning. There's no way, just by listening, you were you were going to know that was dad. If you thought it was just a standard tuned guitar. Yeah. But he had this droning going on. He's playing with the top. What the hell is going on there? I couldn't couldn't figure it out until I got like a magazine or something and looked at some tabs and I was like. Dad, gad, D A D G A D. Oh, so he's got it tuned up weird. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you know what? And and he was a guy. I mean, on the eighth day, God created Led Zeppelin, right? Remember <laughs> yeah. that? Yeah. And, and, and I wonder, I wonder. Cliff actually, with I Land of Led Zeppelin. I just want to throw that out there for Sue Camerano. <laughs> That's right. It was spray painted on the bridge to, to the next town from us. Do you remember what was spray painted on the on Nichols Department Store's sidewall? No. Bloody Smegma, my old band. <laughs> was it? <laughs> yes, I didn't do that. Um, but here, here's something that's interesting. You, you got me thinking. We, to, to us and to everyone of that generation, Jimmy Page was a he was a god. He was a guitar god. Yeah, one of those, one of the guitar gods in those days. Right. If we hop on YouTube, this is now, like pretty much prior to Van Halenish. Like he wasn't yeah. really blowing up yet. It was sort of like Page, Clapton, yep. Hendrix. Yeah. Maybe Pete Townsend. Eh, I and love Pete, but no, we love Pete. But there were there were a certain group of guys that were in a, in a bigger hierarchy right. than the rest of the guys. There were. So now think about it today. You didn't have the exposure. Yeah, but today, if we hop on YouTube, there are people doing insanely impressive, fast, oh, difficult yeah. things. They're not guitar gods. No. Would Jimmy Page? If what he did, if he did the exact same things in 2024, I don't think anyone would label him a guitar god. Hmm. You know, because that's a great analysis. I mean, you could you could say that about singers too. Yeah. You, you know, you put up, you put. We've said this on the show before. You put Mick Jagger on. Oh my uh, God! Yeah. On a, on a talent show, television talent show, they would hit the buzzer right away. <laughs> he would be done. He would be done. And, oh, that was pretty good. Thank you. But, but that was good too. And so today, everyone is so, everyone who's on YouTube is so technically Happy proficient. You. Right, he right. Get, he would get the X too. He would be done. He would be done in yeah, a second. No way. And in the world of guitar, 
I everywhere you I mean, all day long, you know, once you start watching the algorithm figures out, you know, we're guitar geeks. And my feed is filled all day long with people doing things that maybe not as creative, but are every bit as impressive as Eddie. Mm -hmm. Some people who are as creative as Jimmy. And and they're you say that's great, but they're not famous. They're not making a right. lot of money off it. And, and is that maybe it's a great thing? Maybe it's the great equalizer, or maybe it's a horrible thing. I think the general direction of a lot of the well, maybe it's the guitar that stuff that comes up on my feed because the algorithm knows what you watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I got a lot of shredder guys on my feed. Right. But I feel like there's an excessive amount of shredder guys. Excessive. And. Uh, very, very recently, as recently as maybe today or yesterday, Ace Fraley got in trouble for saying Van Halen wasn't that great, but he didn't really say that because right. I read the full, I read the full interview, uh, of what he did actually say. What he, what he was trying to make the point was he was a blues place, blues based player. Right. As am I, you know, I got a couple of tricks on my sleeve shredding wise, but I'm pretty much a blues based player. And, um, he's like. This this idea of playing 500 notes really fast doesn't do anything for him. He likes melodic, right, uh, bluesy type solos, and that makes him, you know, that that gets him turned on as far as a guitar player. And, so he'll uh, gravitate more to a Clapton than a Steve Vai Ashachiani type player, right? Or or even um, a Stevie Ray, right? Because Stevie Ray, to me, is servicing the song, and that's kind of what he was saying. That yeah. He feels that Van Halen wasn't really servicing a lot of the songs, that he was just kind of going off and being in his own little world. Right. But the band is named after him. He's got this double tapping guitar technique and a whole bunch of other crazy ideas, techniques and ideas that were definitely not part of the fabric of guitar playing until he came along. Right. Uh, definitely not in the mainstream anyway, because, you know, they're old videos of, of uh, Ace two hand tapping with kiss and maybe then they said that he started it but maybe van hills i don't know what, what gives a damn and, and eddie was very clear that he said i didn't start this you know, yeah for the eddie, internet nobody could search things and whatever but you know lately everybody's going oh eddie van halen didn't invent tapping and and pull hammer-ons and pull-offs and this and that i never claimed that i did but i do know how and when i figured out how to do it uh led zeppelin's playing and jimmy page is going like this. He's going. Okay, so he's got his hand in the air, and I'm going. So, so basically, I just moved the nut. Instead of using this hand, I use this hand. So, like right now, if I go like this, you can't tell which finger I'm using this hand or that hand. You tell me, right hand or left hand? I'm using both, okay? You know, we said, you know, they show a guy from the 1940s playing an acoustic guitar, double tapping or whatever. Yeah. But in Ed's little world, you know, again, this harkens back that he didn't have videos to watch of other guys. Right. He's in his room. He's... 15, 16 years old, 18 years old. And he goes, oh, if I do this and I put my finger here and then I, if I do that, you know, he, he was figuring out his own. He didn't really steal it from anyone. No, no, not at all. Not at all. And, you know, if if he came up right now, if, if tapping hadn't entered the public uh, mindset or, or the public arena and he did that on YouTube, people say, like, all right, that's kind of cool. It's a poly trick, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And because I mean, there's a kid on YouTube I see all the time, and he's and of course I'm jealous because of my follicular situation. But he's got <laughs> this big head of hair, but yeah. not long, and it, and he's and he plays an acoustic guitar. And he has this over, and he does like a lot of tapping and right. all these over exaggerated hanging, hanging moves, the guitars and and yeah, harmonic everything added harmonic chords and everything. Yeah, and it's just very over exaggerated and artificially dramatic, and I find it annoying. In all honesty, <laughs> uh, and he's great, and he's great, yeah. um, but just it, it just it doesn't strike me as organic. It just strikes mm -hmm. me as silly. But peep, if if Eddie came up like that, and he was, and all the joy that we see in his face, and the joy we hear in his music, maybe a crotchety old Dave Cohen would say the same thing about him. Yeah, uh, but you know. But you get I, Ace's point, don't you? That yeah, 
I he do. Wasn't, he wasn't saying Eddie sucked or anything like, or I'm better than Eddie or anything like no. that, which is the way they portrayed it in the media to make it look like he was an asshole. Yeah. What he was really saying was he felt like a lot of times Eddie wasn't servicing the song. No. That he was just, it was, he was just sort of showboating and, and playing all these notes and stuff. Well, you, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing it to my eyes and my, my ears, so to speak. Uh, that very famous clip of him and G.E. Smith. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, maybe because I've watched that a thousand times, and I think that's one of the places where it's kind of apparent. Mm-hmm. You know, he they, he comes up with a little riff, and they start jamming it. Right. And then the, the SNL band has always been great, and this particular version of it's great. That, that, I mean, sure, that was rehearsed, but Paul Schaefer yeah. put together something years ago called like the 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 All Star Garage Band. I don't know if anyone try to look that up on on YouTube. Right. Um, I guess it was like in the nineties. So he brought on like uh, he brought on Eddie, he brought on Sambora, and he had a they had a couple of drummers, and every every everyone on the in the band was very famous. And Paul made it a point <laughs> to say we didn't rehearse any of this. This is just us playing our childhood favorite things. Right. And they were doing some kind of Motown type song and Eddie was like being Eddie, but yeah. he seemed completely lost. He wasn't, he, he's not a Motown guy. <laughs> right. Right. He's playing like Eddie shredding over Motown songs and it didn't work. And then when Sambora got his chance, he was a little more soulful and bluesy then he was able to adapt. So that just show, goes to show you that. You yeah. Know, you can't always put different guitar players in different situations and have the magic happen. No, it's true. It's true. And, and you see that all the time. Like every time you have, you know, like at the, um, you know, the whole Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Awards, there's always going to, going to be one act when they're pulling everyone on stage when you can see someone who's otherwise good. Right. Uh, just it, it's not working. It's, it's not fitting mm-hmm. for them. You know, a lot of those big monstrous jams like Rockatr- Rockestra, remember that one? That was yeah. Like, yeah. They, had like, they had like nine different guitar players playing at the same time and playing different solos and and you know like half of the guys were doing sort of a chuck berry imitation the other half were yeah laughed an imitation and, and, and that, was, hard. that was a situation where they just couldn't be honestly original with the kind of music they were given to play if, no. they're given, if they're given a chuck berry type song to play what are you going to do that you're going to play like chuck yeah and it doesn't do anything or did you see the um there was that little flick that it was with uh, Jimmy Page, Zach, and The Edge. Yeah. Um, this is going to get loud. Very, this, that's it. I couldn't think of the title. Yeah. yeah. And and I'm a huge U2 fan. You know, I flew out to Vegas just, yes, and so for, one, was, just yeah. for one night. And I, yeah. And um, But he does something very specific that mm-hmm. does not lend itself to, to other types of music. Right. And, and I, and he was, I felt like when I, wa- I felt bad for him watching that movie hmm. and he just seemed lost through the entire thing. Like musically, he just, he was just sort of watching. I mean, they were both really just watching Jimmy. Jimmy kind of hmm. took it over. Right. But, but, but the edge who was wonderful, but he's wonderful in a very different way. Like it was almost like trying to put Bob Dylan on that it's show. Mindful of the first uh, G3 tour video that I saw. And I saw that tour in concert. You've got Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, who are, are sort of, you know, similar type yeah. guitar players, you know. Yeah. And, and and as everyone knows, that Joe taught Steve a thing or two back in the day. He was his teacher. Right. Um, and then you had Eric Johnson, who oh my God. Yeah. was on the stage. And he seemed like the fish out of water during the whole thing when they all three of them at the at the finale played together. He's wearing a big, gigantic pair of headphones. And right. He's got this tone, and he's doing all this melodic stuff, but he's trying to shoehorn it into this, heavy metal kind of riff thing and it was, yeah. it was very odd it was very good very impressively played but it didn't like that's not his thing yeah. that's not his thing he's not using whammy bars and making all kinds of weird noises he's he's more of a a melodic type a shred yeah bar. now now let me let me take what you just said and let's 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 connect it to our topic for tonight so when when the Steve Vai's of the world came up, when the Eddie Van Halen's of the world came up, you know all the people we now call shredders, you know, because that that term has been around for however long, but not forever, right? What's the future for them when a sixteen year old kid from his or her basement can do the same thing just as well now? Hmm. Like you know, uh, the type of 
music th that makes the the different the creative types different you know i'll think of a keith richards who's playing a, a screwy tuning with five strings and not worried about being a shredder but coming up with a cool sound you know um and, and who has stage presence mm -hmm. um what is the I, future I can think of a guitar player right now off the top of my head i know he annoys the shit out of you every time you see a video of johnny depp oh <laughs> Yeah, he's got this yeah. great look yeah but i don't think he can play am i wrong no no you're Tell not comments you're not i would but, love to hear some some isolated guitars of him. but you know what he's having a good time no i don't he give him a, a pass. mediocre player or whatever but it, i don't give him a pass it's yeah. all it's all looks and no substance it's, it's just a, it's, i think it's obnoxious and the <laughs> fact that wonderful guitar players are letting are playing with him um i don't understand it i'm jealous i admit it i'm resentful <laughs> Handsome, rich, <laughs> successful. Has, has but, hair. <laughs> yeah, has hair. Really good hair. Really expensive but, vintage but, guitar. But that you're, I think you just made that point. So, so in today's world, he's doing something creatively that, you know, the basement shredders aren't. So the basement shredders, and it's all over your feed, right? There's yeah. going to be a 16-year-old kid from you know, Dublin or a London or Detroit or Tallahassee it's a very who is, small world now. yeah. Who's playing Eddie styled leads, maybe better than Eddie. Mm -hmm. But in terms of folks, you know, Johnny Depp, as much as, you know, you, you, it's so much fun to read the comments every time they post a video. <laughs> <Enough>. <laughs> um, but he's doing something very creative. He, he is, he's cultured this little look for himself. He wears the guitar slightly below his knees, I think. And, <laughs> And, and he has this cool, dramatic way and his mellow way, and he wears 8,000 necklaces and ribbons and things like that. But he's creating so, sort of a – artistically, he's creating a look and a vibe. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and maybe that's what it means, you know, because you cannot, you know, just hop up to a producer or try to, you know, make it by saying, I can play really, really, really fast all over the neck. That gets you, I would guess that gets you nowhere right now. Right. It's hard to break in that way. But Eddie, especially or, 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 rock yeah. instrumental music, because just the, the competition is so fierce. Yeah. You know, or just AI hey, will just do it at this point. You know, <laughs> I haven't even tried that. But, but then again, you take, I said Eddie before I met Johnny, you take a Johnny Depp, a young up and coming Johnny Depp who's going to say, I could create a vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, I could create a look. I, I, I hold my guitar in a sort of a unique way. And yeah, I could, I'm, you know, modestly competent on the guitar. And suddenly in the world of YouTube, maybe that is a bad, you know, impact of it that, you know, a real, a creative shredder is going to get lost in the mix. Compared, and they'll, they'll take a Johnny Depp any day over a, a shredding guy. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is a point we made on the show a gazillion times. Yeah. If you yeah. don't have stage presence, at the, I don't care how great yeah. you are. Yeah, you gotta you gotta look the part. You gotta have you know put on sunglasses or whatever the hell, or wave your hair around if you have hair. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But you Throw guys car around your back, play behind your back, whatever it takes. You guys pull out kazoo's in your songs. I think it's so much <laughs> yeah. fun. Yeah. You know, we, um, have, we have a megaphone this year, which is going to be interesting. Thank oh, you, I Amazon. Wireless back in '52. Oh my God. Oh, I like that. We'll be using it for two different songs. Tommy holds up signs from the drum kit. Yeah, you know, and so in terms of what the technology and and, and more, more specifically YouTube does, you know, maybe just maybe an impact of it is that it's making us work extra hard mm -hmm. to do what Scott's talking about is to find you know creative ways to keep people happy and entertained, and I think maybe you know the folks we see, I, I just I could picture in my head. You know, like you, you see, we've seen like six year old kids, mm -hmm. you know, who are just all over the neck, yeah, playing phenomenally. And you're like, all right, I'm bored. And you ask yourself, did these kids exist when we were kids? No, I don't think so. Or these, this is a new prodigies that are being created because of the internet and how they can learn things, yeah, uh, and in a timely manner and see visually. You know, we, uh, we didn't, you know, we, we had talked about this with our upcoming guest ryan cook who 
used to watch, look at Circus Magazine and and yeah. Rock, rock Concert and Midnight Special and all that stuff to to visually see things because it wasn't available anywhere. No, no, and, and now you know you, when when I was a kid, uh, you were in my house many times. Do you remember the piano we had? We had a little I stand up conversation pit, but I don't know yeah. what the piano was. It was right next to it. And it was actually a player piano with those little player, those paper oh, with the scrolls. Little holes in the paper? Yeah. yeah. So I you know, the kids who can shred all over the neck, I would posit that many of them, not all, but many of them are that player piano. Like it's not that there's thought, soul, or love in their playing, it's just mom and dad are just forcing them to take lessons and look at YouTube and learn all this stuff. And they're doing it the same way we might send our own kids to play soccer or something like that. But it's not at some point though, the, the love of music takes over. It has uh, to, right? And, and, yeah. yeah. And you're in, and you get your own inspirations. Yeah. You know, playing drums, uh, starting off playing drums. My dad was a drummer. He was kind of like my first teacher. And then he was teaching me a lot of jazzy stuff with brushes and, mallets and all this stuff and then when he wasn't teaching me i was just home clowning around right i'm playing, I'm playing the who <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah maniacal keith moon drumming you know smashing everything and hitting everything and he's like whoa whoa whoa, what are you doing you don't have any technique you're you know no this is keith moon <laughs> you know had that go <laughs> that's right I like, oh i'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> i was yeah, off was, tonight. whenever yeah. i make a weird noise dave asked me to do it again yeah i do I do every time. You want and to talk then, about uh, some guests we got coming up? Yeah, yeah. We're looking at a, this in a, in a secret way. In a very secret way. We can wrap so up we, our intermezzo show here. Yeah, we have um, a gigantic guest uh, coming up. One of the legends and giants in in not only the guitar world but in the entertainment guitar world. Meaning, not just sitting home alone, but um, recording albums with multiple bands. Recording albums with an extraordinarily famous legendary band performing with an extraordinarily famous legendary band being on stage with legendary folks and one little hint producing an album by a guitar tales guest and i'll leave it at that <laughs> there you go yeah um and then uh we may have a new sponsor coming on board soon. that's right that's right from asbury that, park we're working right. on it yep. can't we're give any more hints that. than that yep yep we'll leave it at that yeah. Uh, don't worry, Charles Liberty, you're not going anywhere. We'll have no, two sponsors. Yeah, we are we are adding to the uh, cadre, if you will, yeah. of guests. So you know, really great things coming up. And, and these shows are great because it's just Scott and I doing what we do every time we chat anyway. But if right. it's of any interest to anyone, which we hope it is, you can uh, get we'll a little get out of it. Three or four views. Maybe, maybe that many. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, this was a lot of fun. We want you to stay tuned for all our shows and do what Scott always asks you to do. Click, you know, hit subscribe, hit like, yeah, whatever absolutely. platform you're watching. Um, we made about 12 bucks last week on the show. We're very proud yeah. of that. So that'll <laughs> maybe pull us up to $12 and 50 cents, but no, here's, what a, we, uh, here's a, yeah. a statistic for you. 97% yeah. of our viewers are not subscribers. Right. Dun, right. Dun, dun, dun. And you there know you go. You, are. you do. And, and so that's what helps our show. I mean, if you right. like content, hit the like button. Subscribe, yeah. please. Just, yeah. We're it's, not going to bother you with all kinds of emails and stuff. We're not that. We're not. No, that we, yeah, we're not like we do it. We, this, is a, this is a labor of love from yeah. two old friends from the 1970s. But what's really cool, and, and I like to brag about this, is that there are statistics we've seen, you know, that we get from the Facebook analytics. There, there have been months when we touched three quarters of a million people. Uh, so it, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, it feels really good. So with that closing note, we want to thank you so much for joining us. And the next show you get from us uh, will be from that very, very well-known person. So we'll talk to you soon on Guitar Tells. Dave That's Cohen it. and Scott Guitarmas is angled from New Jersey. Noi yeah, <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say Jersey and Noise Network Studios in Jersey. And Noise Network Studios. And we're going to have dinner tomorrow night, Dave and that's I. Right. We'll have something to report back to you. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. All right. Have, have a good, good night, night. everybody. Take care.
How's it going? This is Weedles from Hair Supply. You're watching Guitar Tales with Diamond Dave Cohen and the legend, the guitar Scott Engel. Get some. 